The harsh coldness of a spiritual winter can be difficult to bear. Why do we have to endure such prolonged seasons of difficulty? I wish the answer was simple, but it is not. Because we are the problem. We are the reason for long spiritual winters. The goal of the fruit-bearing cycle is to remove the cover of our selfish human nature to reveal the righteousness of Christ within us. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Often this cycle is not a pleasant experience because we see ourselves as we are, not as we think we are. Our self-deception is pruned away by the working of the Holy Spirit. During our spiritual walk with Jesus, we are to awake to our imputed righteousness and allow the Holy Spirit to remove the cover of our selfish human nature to reveal Christ within us. Our responsibility is to yield to the awakening process and endure the loss of our human identity while we are conformed to the image of Christ. The New Testament clearly teaches that the imputed righteousness implanted at regeneration is designed by God to yield spiritual fruit. We must not lose sight of this simple truth. The fruit of righteousness is the spiritual fruit produced in us by the revelation of our imputed righteousness. Jesus taught in the Gospel of John that he is the vine, but we are the branches that sprout from the vine. According to this metaphor, the branches are the natural expression of the vine. All spiritual fruit that glorifies the Father will grow in the lives of these branches. Even though the branches produce the fruit, it's the responsibility of the vine to provide the branches with the necessary vitality and sustenance to be fruitful. It's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in our lives, not our responsibility. We are only responsible for the process we endure. Simply stated, the fruit is the product of the vine, while the branches are the conduits for the life force of the vine. Consider this thought. Where does the vine end and the branches begin? Does the vine end at ground level, or does it end several feet above ground? Is the vine, the roots, and everything visible being part of the branches? Or is the vine and the branches one expression? A fruitful saint is fruitful in every season of the fruit-bearing cycle. But he or she may not actually be producing fruit. Fruitfulness is not a product we produce, but a process we endure. A vine being pruned is just as fruitful as a flourishing vine laden with large clusters of vintage grapes. I am convinced that every facet of the vine, 
from the root to the fruit is an expression of the vine. To make a distinction between the vine and the branches is dangerous because we are subtly saying that our identity is in the branch, but not in the vine. One thing John chapter 15 made clear, every fruitful Christian will endure seasons of pruning. The cutting back of unnecessary growth is needed in order to prepare the saint for a new season of fruit bearing. The cutting away of this growth, the pruning of the Christian life, is the revelation process. The removing of the cover referred to in Romans chapter 1 verse 17. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 also indicates that a pruning process is necessary in order to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Let's return to Hebrews and study this point. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. This verse uses the English word of chastening to describe the pruning process of the fruit-bearing cycle. Does the Greek concept of chastisement have the same application as our English application? When we think of chastisement in the English sense, we picture a child being spanked as a form of corporal punishment. But does the Greek word hold this concept? The Greek word pahedia, that is translated chastening, is defined in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance as tutelage, education, or training. But the word also has the implication of disciplinary correction. Joseph there, in his Greek lexicon, expanded on the definition given by James Strong when he wrote that Pahedia includes the whole training and education of children that relates to the cultivation of mind and morals. Joseph Thayer also wrote that this word includes the training and care of the body that cultivates the soul. The idea that Pahedia chastisement has only the application of corporal punishment is to miss the purpose and meaning of the whole chastening process. When we visualize athletes conditioning themselves for athletic competition, we picture a good application of the Pahedia chastising process. When we send our children to school, they also are engaging in the scriptural concept of the chastising process. The word does not necessarily indicate correction. A tutor is a private instructor whose primary goal is to increase the knowledge or virtue of his or her pupil. When we apply these thoughts to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11. We realize that God has provided us with a private instructor, a tutor whose primary goal is to mature our virtue in God. The Gospel of John in chapters 14 and 15 identifies our private tutor as the Holy Spirit the great comforter of the Lord, the Spirit of Truth, whose primary responsibility is to reveal to us the person of Jesus Christ. 
the tutorship of the Holy Spirit is designed to nurture us through the fruit-bearing cycle. He is the life force that flows from the vine to the branches that matures the fruit. And he is the pruning agent who judges our lives and removes the cover of our carnal human nature. The pruning process is the judgment of our God in our lives. It is the cutting away of our self-willed human nature. It is the cross, alive and active in our lives. Now we come to the concept of divine judgment. Christians fear divine judgment. They see it as the heavy chastening of the Lord. However, the Bible provides a different picture. God judges the righteous, but he is angry with the wicked every day. So wrote King David in the book of Psalms. David also wrote that the Lord tries, tests, and proves the hearts of the righteous. These are strong and hard words to bear in the light of our understanding of God's loving compassion. How do we reconcile this idea of judgment? When we correlate these two verses with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, we realize that the judgment and trial of the righteous is the tutorship of the Holy Spirit, who is instructing us, curbing our passions, correcting our mistakes, and increasing our virtue. We also read in the book of Psalms that the meek he will guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. The meek and humble are the blessed of the Lord, and they shall be guided into the paths of righteousness by the judgment of God. The process of judgment that the meek endure opens to them the secret ways of the Lord. In fact, the meek will be guided by the eye of the Lord. These phrases indicate an intimate relationship that allows the eyes of the Lord to be seen and experienced. Judgment should be feared only by those who remain defiant and disobedient to the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. Should our hearts remain humble and teachable, the judgments of God are peaceable and pure. They remove the cover of our carnal human nature to reveal the righteousness of Christ in us. The Gospel of John teaches that the mission of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the person of Christ. We often think that this only applies to our understanding of Jesus, but I believe we have missed the greater application. The mission of the Holy Spirit is not only to reveal the person of Christ to us, but He is to reveal Christ through us. The revealed righteousness is the goal of the Holy Spirit. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, the law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thine loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. 
The Bible also teaches that an important element of the pruning process is the implantation of the Word of God in our hearts. In order for this process to occur, there must be a willingness on our part to do the will of God. We cannot ever hope to walk in the power of the revealed righteousness without being obedient to God's revealed will. Why do we allow the Word of God access to our innermost being? The answer is simple. We hunger for intimate relationship with the Lord. And therefore, we allow the Word of God to prune away our self-will. The problem we have today in the church is obvious. We have substituted fashionable Christian doctrines and emotional enthusiasm for true encounters with the pruning sword of God's Word. Implanting the Word in our hearts is much more than simple Bible memorization. It is obedience to the revealed will of God. It also involves a willingness to endure the pruning cycles of God. King David realized one very important spiritual principle, and that is the dangers of hiding the righteousness of God in his heart. We must also consider the seriousness of this principle, because it is possible to hide the righteousness of Christ behind a carnal human nature shrouded in religious attitudes. we honestly don't realize the seriousness of Christ's imputed righteousness being hid in our lives. The greatest enemy to true spiritual maturity is traditional religious thinking. We must allow the Holy Spirit to remove the cover of our humanity in order to allow the light of Christ to shine through us. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus taught the parable of a nobleman going into a far country to receive his kingdom. The nobleman gave one pound to each of his ten servants. On his return, he discovered that one servant buried his pound in the ground out of fear for the nobleman. This servant was sternly chastened for his disobedience. Consider this thought. We are the servants of Christ who have received His imputed righteousness. The day will come when we must give an account to Christ for what we accomplished with His righteousness. Those saints of God who bury His imputed righteousness in the ground of their hearts will be sternly rebuked by the fire of His holy eyes. King David listed several attitudes as proof of God's righteousness being revealed in his heart. It is interesting to note that each of these attitudes was expressed in the great congregation. The house of God, the local congregation, was the recipient of God's righteousness through David. Let's list the attitudes David manifested in the congregation of God. David spoke and taught the revelation that God had granted him. He served the local congregation as a teacher and preacher. He also became a witness 
to the great congregation and to the world at large of the faith and salvation found in God. His testimony was built upon an intimate relationship with God, and he shared his experiences with the world. Sharing our faith is not a doctrinal exercise in Christian rhetoric. It's being a conduit of Christ's righteousness. Sharing our faith is testifying about our personal experiences with Jesus. Lost humanity does not want our doctrines about Christ. Instead, they want to see Christ. Bible debate is not how we share our faith. A true witness is a declaration about our personal experiences with Christ. David did not conceal God's loving kindness and truth from the great congregation. He realized that he was to be the conduit of God's love and compassion to the saints of God. He was a true servant to the church. David sought to serve his local congregation, not to be the object of their service. Now we come to the crux of this topic. David realized that service to his local congregation was the only way to allow God's righteousness to be revealed in his life. Three millennia of divine revelation has not changed this simple principle. The local congregation was designed by God to be a fruitful field of his imputed righteousness. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches of his body. Therefore, the local congregation is the vineyard of God. While we remain faithful to the vineyard, we will remain fruitful. While in God's congregation, we will endure the fruit-bearing process, and we will endure the pruning of the Lord. In the end, we will nurture the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have exercised themselves in the local congregation. The key to spiritual maturity is the servant attitude being exercised in the local congregation. Consider this thought. Is it possible that our personal spiritual frustrations are directly connected to our refusal to serve in the local congregation? The servant heart is also the pruning hook used by God to remove the cover of our fallen human nature. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Psalm chapter 125 verse 3 is a sobering experience when this verse is applied to the church today. The authority of the wicked will not rest on the righteous, unless the righteous identify with the wicked and conform to their way of thinking. The Christian church today has conformed themselves to the world. They use the world's methods in TV evangelism, in gifts and offerings, in program development, even in a compromised message being preached. Don't be too quick to blame the ordained ministers because they provide the type of ministry we demand. We must have comfort, intellectual stimulation, 
and synthesized pastors and preachers. But we don't want to be spiritually challenged. Is it possible the reason we see the universal church weak and defeated is a result of our hands touching iniquity and the judgment of the world is upon us. When we identify with the world, we strengthen our carnal human nature. This action restricts the ability of our imputed righteousness to shine through us. This fact is obvious. To the degree we strengthen our carnal human nature, is to the degree we place the cover back on to our imputed righteousness. Let's once again reiterate the realization that carnality is not restricted to corrupt, sensuous human expression. The carnal mind conformed to a compromised, lukewarm Christian religion is the hardest attitude to expose and break down. It is a sad thing to realize that our personal Christian walk is at enmity with God because of our comfortable religious attitudes. Sarks is Sarks. No matter how ornate we robe it in Christian religious thinking. Faith is the active element that removes the cover to our imputed righteousness. This is a strange thought. The church believes it is filled with faith, but true righteousness is absent from our witness. Is it possible that faith is not the Christian doctrine we memorize and confess, but much more? This thought can cause controversy since much has been taught about confessing the politically correct Christian doctrines. Should we stand on the vogue doctrines and scriptures that are propagated by the current trend, do we then have faith? How far from the truth this concept is! The Apostle Paul taught that faith is a living spirit, not a doctrine we put our trust in. The fact that we have the same spirit as all believers indicates that the spirit of faith is the Holy Spirit. The spirit of faith is not the doctrine we believe, but the person we trust. The primary mission of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us and through us the person of Jesus. Faith is the revelation of that person through us and the belief we put in his personal revelation. There should be no doubt in our thinking about our carnal human nature. In order for the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us, we must endure the crucifixion, the pruning of our flesh nature. We must allow the Holy Spirit to remove the cover of our old man in order for the righteousness of our new man to be revealed in us. Most Christians blame the devil for their spiritual frustration and their defeated spiritual condition. Is it possible that our spiritual frustration is caused by the Holy Spirit crucifying our carnal human nature? The truth is obvious. Christians spend more time fighting the cross than the devil. 
The cross is in us, and we must endure its operation. The only obstacle we have to our spiritual maturity is our flesh. Even the devil can only assault our lives through the arena of our flesh nature. It is true, our flesh dies hard. The process the Holy Spirit must use to reveal the righteousness of Christ is difficult because the process requires a yielded human host who hungers for the spiritual life of Christ. We spend more time resisting the Holy Spirit, causing Him grief, than we ever do fighting the devil. The fruit-bearing cycle is an automatic process for all who have been implanted with Christ's imputed righteousness. We cannot run or hide from the process. All we can do is frustrate our pruning by resisting the Holy Spirit. Is it possible that the spiritual frustration we now endure is the result of our resistance to the pruning of the Holy Spirit? Never forget this truth. As surely as we will have seasons of harvest, we will also have seasons of pruning. Let's not frustrate the process by hardening our religious attitudes. Let us be yielded vessels to the Holy Spirit.